So in this video, I'm going to be breaking down all these pallets right here for a project I am doing uh, in the near future. And, you know, in the past I've broken down pallets, you know, hammer, nails, pry bars, that kind of stuff. It just takes a long time. In this video, I'm trying a few new techniques to me to hopefully make this a lot more efficient so I'm just not wasting money on labor processing free material. There's kind of a conundrum right there. But before I get there, I kind of need to piss off probably half the people that are watching this video right off the get-go and talk about the material because I have to admit, I am not a fan of rustic pieces. I am not a fan of shabby chic. I'm not a fan of patinaed works from the get-go. You know, a piece of furniture that survives hundreds of years and gathers a natural patina. Honestly, I respect that because as a, a representation of the craftsman, they built something that could last that long and they take that kind of abuse. I love those pieces. But to build something brand new to make it look somewhat decrepit, that, that just turns me off. It goes against my craftsman skills. Now that's purely my opinion. Also, if you've noticed, even the pieces I build out of construction lumber, which I build a lot of them for my home furniture, I do everything I can to get away from anything that isn't just absolutely perfect straight grain. I don't like the wavy grains. I don't like the knots and stuff like that. So using basically the worst material that they can produce, the cheapest stuff that they can buy, the stuff that they don't expect to last even six months in high-end pieces, that's just not going to be me. So you have to understand the properties of the material to find a proper application for that. And for me, that's outdoor stuff. Because in outdoor projects, this type of material, you're basically just using it for a barrier. You know, you're building a composting bin. You're just trying to keep the dirt out from the side and have it look uniform. You're building bird houses. You're sticking them up on the tree. You want them to age to gray. The birds won't like them that way. You don't expect them to last too long. It's just a barrier. Hence, when I am using pallet wood kind of for projects, I am not surfacing it. I am not going to be running these things through my expensive power tools. I am not going to damage them that way. I I worked hard to pay for that kind of stuff. I had thought at one time about maybe, you know, running them through my drum sander with a really heavy grit, you know, something like a 20 grit, really thick things, so that even if I ran over a nail or something like that, there's no way I could damage the drum, but I'm not even going to risk that myself. If I had to do any kind of surface prep to the board, that project needs to be, to me, needs to be something more than pallet wood. I will cross crib, cut them all day long with a circular saw. I'll even rip them to certain sizes using my circular saw. Because that, while nice, isn't that big a loss if something goes wrong. Now, how I use those pallets kind of determines what kind of pallets I like to collect up. And I pass over probably 95% of them. Uh, I have a couple of stops in my town that are along my normal path. And as I'm driving by, if I look over, I see one that I'm going to like. I'll pick it up and throw it in the back of my truck. And then I just kind of set them over here to collect, like a lot of pallet hoarders do. But, you know, there's a lot of information out there about what good pallets are, what bad pallets are, you know, the different paints, the different codes, that kind of stuff went on them. The places I go to typically are going to be one, one-time use kind of pallets, and uh, they're generally going to be the bigger ones. Uh, I prefer pallets that are extremely long because that gets me the longest boards that I can divide up. The standard style pallets are what, they're about three by four feet right there. A, they typically use thinner boards, so I get less material, but also because of the way I break them apart to get good quality material for my projects, uh, the boards are just too short for a lot of things I like to do. So typically I try to stare clear of the short standard style ones and go for the longer ones that are going to get me both wider boards and longer boards. 
Now, a lot of people, whenever they pick out board uh, palettes, they tend to look for the hardwood styles of ones and steer care of the pine ones. To me, it doesn't really matter because it is going to be an outdoor project and because I am not going to be surfacing them. They're going to have all these blemishes and stuff on them, staining. Uh, so more than likely, I'm throwing paint on top of that. And once you paint a piece of wood, you can't really tell too easily whether it's pine, poplar, or mahogany which you know, occasionally you will find in pallets. But the, most of the stuff I'm looking for are these slats and they're generally about a half inch thick, which is another reason why I'm not going to be surfacing them because if you surface it, you're going to be down to three eighths and a quarter inch and who wants to work with that thin stuff? Uh, also, you occasionally will use the, the side pieces, uh, the two by fours, but not very often because you know on a pallet like this you got a solid board all the way across but for most of the times what you get is boards with these cutouts right here can you see that so that's for the fork forks to go into uh, so generally basically your two by four now becomes a strength of a two by two because you've cut that board in half but if you're planking it on both sides and you want to do a kind of a stick frame Hey, why not? A doghouse doesn't really need to be that strong. A two by two is more than strong enough. You're just gonna have a little bit extra air in the walls, which hey, that adds air adds insulation. Other things you need to notice about pallet wood is the outsides take a huge amount of abuse. They get dragged on, they get oil smudges on from the forklifts, all that kind of stuff. So to me, just like when I buy construction lumber or, or six quarter hardwood and stuff like that, that last inch or two of the boards, top and bottom, that needs to be cut off first. You don't want all that stuff getting into your project, affecting your paints, all that kind of stuff. Plus it's that fact that because these boards are so green whenever they put them on there, typically your cracks, there's always gonna be some cracks even though you don't see them. So if you just cut off that little inch, it just, it makes the boards more durable. They're not going to fall apart in the later date because I'm probably going to be using full, the full length of it in my projects. So if the cracks are already established right there, I don't want to be nailing into that. So I guess like everything else I do, it's kind of always about the grain. The type of project determines the type of material I'm going to be collecting and how I process it is determined by the material step itself. But since basically all I'm using is the slats and just a few of those stretchers, I'm gonna be creating a lot of waste. So my first step in processing pallets is to start a fire. So here are the tools I used to use to break apart pallets. Of course, a nice heavy framing hammer. I have a pry bar, it helped a lot to get uh, the nails up. I would also use a hoe, because you could kind of wedge it and pull it up. But a lot of times, because these boards are so thin, I would end up breaking a board with this thing. And then uh, a sawzall to cut the ends off. To make my life easier, in my last video, which I linked to uh, here, I want to replace all of these with something that I can just stand up and use. I don't want to bend over as often. So I built myself a pallet buster. And along with that, I'm just gonna use a circular saw this time. And hopefully with these two tools, I should be able to knock all this out. So first things first, yeah. This one right here, I'm not gonna be saving these side pieces because they got the cut out and for this project, I don't really need them. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut off both sides all the way around so I separate the spine from uh, the edges.
now we pull out the pallet buster. The idea behind the pallet buster is it's just going to roll along this board and be able to lift up the pallets evenly, whereas my claw hammer would pick up one side and a lot of times it would break them. So here we go. Up underneath, lift, easy. Nails stay in it, so I'm just going to create a pile that I know that there are nails in them. Now, there are a lot of boards in this stack, like this one right here, that I'm not going to be keeping. So just pick and choose what you want to keep because it's all free, so it doesn't really matter if you waste a little bit. From there, it's just a matter of rinse and repeat. Jump through the stack and end up with a whole bunch of boards with nails sticking out of them. Now, some things I've discovered about using, you know, a pallet buster is if you have a pallet that has really large cutouts and stuff like that, this goes in your don't waste your time. Uh, I'm just smashing these things up. It's going to take so much more labor to get these out. Uh, just too much lever against that point. Also, I found out that while cutting it is a process I'm going to do uh, before I put it into a project just because of all those splits and stuff like that, uh, it doesn't really save much time. Uh, just do the outsides first and then pry up the insides next. If you start with the insides, it just all goes wrong. Now with these European style ones, it really is better to cut these off because you're getting rid of a huge chunks and I can't get my uh, little pry bar around this but I can't come in at an angle on these interior ones and then just, I'll just have to use a hammer on the other one because there's just nothing le to leverage against it because they only put cross beams on one side. With the rest of them, you can kind of use this on the side to wedge it up a little bit and then stick this underneath to do the rest. The other option is to just cut these cr cross boards because there's only one of them. And then you can just take it to a workbench to hammer them out. And after that, you end up with this, a pile of magazine tetanus injectors. This right here is why I hate pallet, working with pallet wood, because in all honesty, up until what I'm going to attempt today, this was a week's of work for me. Not a constant week, but I can't stand to do this for more than 30, 45 minutes. It's boring as hell, it's frustrating, I get angry. So. You know, it's outdoor wood anyway, so I would just kind of leave this pile here. I'd come out, I'd put in my podcaster, a podcast, and I'd just sit here for until I got frustrated, and then, then I'd walk away. And it just took a week to get through a pile like this. Now, here's the way I used to do it. I'd pull out my chopping block with a trash can underneath it, and I'd go grab me a big-ass hammer, a framing hammer, and then various prying tools. Now, this one right here, I didn't use too often. It was mainly just for uh, small nails because you can kind of sink it down this way and pull it up. I have this one right here. Never really liked it. I always felt it kind of dented the wood a little bit too much and it's cumbersome. This was my favorite, though I have to admit that a lot of times I just use a claw on the hammer right here. And basically the monotonous process was I'd come over here and I would hope and pray that the nails were straight because if they weren't straight, you would have to somewhat straighten them out. Then you would just tap them down 
If you were lucky, they would blast out the backside, but normally they don't. And then you would come over and pry them out. Also helps to have a magnet for after the fact is not all, not all of them will land in the trash can. I did that for a long time and then I saw somebody online that did it this way. They used their demolition saw with a really long metal blade. I just don't happen to have one with this new saw right here. And they would simply cut off the nails. So you would do a whole board almost at once with that big long nail. You just kind of like that. Then you come along with a nail punch and just kind of whack at it with a slightly smaller hammer and just blast them through. But as you can see, they don't always come out. Can you see why I get so frustrated over time and I hated this aspect of the project? Well, I didn't want to do that anymore. So. A lot of people have been using these pneumatic nailers, so I did my little research and I found one, one inexpensive brand that a lot of people will recommend. I'll put a link down to my Amazon affiliate account if you want to get it, but I'm gonna try it out on half of this pile and then I'll come back and talk about it. Oh, and the nail gun that people were recommending was this specific air locker, air punch nail. I picked mine up for about 50 bucks on Amazon. Uh, it was on a discount at the time. I will tell you, initial impressions, okay and disappointed. Okay, that it seems pretty solid. It's all metal. This little plastic rubber thing is on a metal handle, that kind of stuff. It does not come with a air connector nozzle right here. And the instructions for this are the worst I've ever seen, but it's kind of typical Chinese that, you know, they don't really care about doing instructions with you. Uh, oh, I don't have them here. It was basically a one-page deal and it had stuff like, you know, you need to oil it, but they didn't, 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 tell, didn't tell you how much to put in. I just assume it's just one or two drops every time you use it, uh, just like a regular air nail gun. But they did say that using too much would be detrimental to it. Could be just copying out. And in the entire, in the instruction, they told you really big, bold letters. Do not exceed the air pressure recommended in the manual. The manual being one page that didn't have a foot pounds of pressure anywhere on it. I actually had to go look it up online. Uh, it wasn't even engraved on it, which most tools would do. And it said between 70 and 120. That's a big variable right there. So I don't know about that. So once again, initial feel, it's a solid device, but man, instructions and the packaging, yeah, meh. Okay, so I'm now about one podcast in, so, you know, about 45 minutes, and I'm two-thirds of the way through the pile, I would say. I got a nice stack right over there I'll show you in a second. And my initial impression, I ain't ever doing this again without some kind of pneumatic gun. I'm actually kind of impressed. Uh, this thing has a big, huge metal thing on the front. For lack of a better term, I'm going to call it an anvil. But basically, you, can, you put it down over it, and you can actually straighten bent nails up. 
I do suggest that you go all the way down, you push forward, and then you put some pressure down because if there's any recoil back, I find that the nails don't go all the way through. And I cranked up the pressure on this thing to, it is uh, looking a little under 90. I'm also kind of impressed that it seems to be fairly efficient. On this small tank that I have, uh, it's uh, I think 1.4 gallons. Uh, it's only cranked over, turned back on twice in this whole time. Now you occasionally come across, uh, you know, nails that are bent halfway down. Well, basically you just push this forward until it stops on that one and then just bend it back up so that you can put that all the way to the ground. So to me, this was definitely worth the money, just the amount of time it's saving me doing this. And the fact that I'm not frustrated at that. I've actually sat here through the full uh, podcast and, you know, I'm still willing to keep going on it. I will say this, you definitely need ear protection. My little AirPods have been working just fine. I put them in after I got going because I realized how loud it is. And then I just took them out to start filming again. And yeah, this thing is loud. Well, there you go. Probably two hours worth of labor with that new pneumatic gun technique. And again, that gun was new to me. And uh, my only recommendation is y'all saw it work here. I got that particular model recommended from other channels. Uh, so there might be better options out there, but for me, 50 bucks, it saved me quite a bit of time, but more importantly, frustration. And I now have material that I'm ready to cut to length and nail into a specific project. What do you think I'm making? <laughs> well, I hope you learned a few trips, tips and techniques along the way. And in the end, I want you to remember that it's always worth the effort to learn, create and share with others. Be safe, have fun.